On the last day of May, 1862, heavy gunfire rumbles and thunders in the distance beyond the Confederate capital, Richmond, Virginia. Gloomy clouds overhead reinforce the darkness that shadows the Union Army. Only the day before, Major General George B. McClellan's Army of the Potomac had seemed poised to move decisively against Richmond. But a torrential rainstorm that night had turned the roads into deep quagmires. McClellan, as usual, decides to wait. By late May, weeks of successful campaigning had brought the Federal enemy nearly to the gates of Richmond. So close to the rebel capital are the lead elements of McClellan's Army of the Potomac that they can hear the clanging of church bells in Richmond, and they can spot the distant church steeples dotting Richmond's cityscape. Both Confederate General Joseph E. Johnston and Union Major General George B. McClellan are thoughtful, cautious commanders. McClellan, in particular, constantly pleads for reinforcements. President Lincoln wants more aggressive action, grumbles that the general had a bad case of the slows. McClellan believes he is facing a Confederate army much larger than his own. In reality, he outnumbers the enemy by 40,000 men. For his part, Johnson knows he is outnumbered and seeks to keep his army out of harm's way while he waits for a chance to strike a decisive blow against the enemy. As the Union Army edges ever closer to Richmond, the James River offers a tempting avenue for the Navy to aid the campaign with heavy artillery and ironclad vessels. On May 15th, a Union Navy flotilla is battered by stubborn Confederate guns atop the high ground along the river at Drury's Bluff. The armor of the ironclads USS Monitor and USS Galena could not withstand the advantageously placed land batteries and had to turn back. It becomes plain that the James will not lead Northern forces into Richmond. The Union Navy's failure does not assuage worries in Richmond about the advancing enemy and Johnston's next move only increases the alarm. Although Confederate batteries block the James, Johnston worries that the Union forces might still approach the capital from the river below Drury's Bluff. Accordingly, he withdraws all his troops south of the Chickahominy River. The troops settle into positions three miles east of Richmond, behind a line of earthworks dug the year before. Even more alarming to the Confederate prospects are reports about Union Major General Irvin McDowell's 1st Corps, numbering more than 30,000 men. McDowell's Corps has kept well north of Richmond to guard Washington. Now it is reported to be marching towards Fredericksburg on its way south to join McClellan. Uniting 1st Corps with McClellan's men would create an overwhelming army of 135,000 troops, the largest military force yet seen in North America. Although the potential junction with McDowell would create a vast and unstoppable Union force, it also gives Johnson an opening. To speed the Union with McDowell while maintaining pressure on Richmond, McClellan has dangerously split his vast army in two, keeping most of his men north to be near to McDowell. McClellan shifts two corps south of the Chickahominy. If Johnson swiftly strikes and crushes the detachment below the river, the remaining Union forces would be vulnerable to a quick attack. The Chickahominy River is an insignificant swiggly line on a map, only 15 yards wide in dry weather. Before the war, several bridges provided easy crossing points, but the shallow river is easily fordable in many places, occasionally splitting into multiple streams to flow around swampy islands. The river twists through a belt of wooded wetlands 300 to 400 yards wide. Beyond the swamps, the terrain rises slightly into stretches of woods or cleared and cultivated bottomland cut with drainage ditches. Despite its shallowness, the Chickahominy is a formidable barrier. The month of May is notorious for relentless and heavy rain, and the river overflows its banks and keeps on rising over wide stretches of swamps and bottomlands. Farther back from the stream, the ground is so saturated with water that it has become a marshy quagmire in which artillery, wagons, and horses are virtually useless. General Johnson orders all the Chickahominy bridges destroyed after he withdraws south of the river on May 16th. Union troops set to work building new bridges. They quickly erect Bottoms Bridge, a span crossing the stream at Williamsburg Road on the direct route to Richmond. A short distance upstream, they also repair the Richmond and York River Railroad Bridge. Union forces begin crossing the river on May 20th. Eventually, two Union Corps, commanded by Brigadier Generals Erasmus D. Keyes and Samuel P. Heintzelman, assume positions on the south bank of the river. 
McClellan's other three corps, under Brigadier Generals Edwin V. Sumner, William B. Franklin, and Fitz John Porter, remained on the North Bank. Brigadier General Keyes moves his 4th Corps along the Williamsburg Road. The night of May 26 brings more rain to soak the troops despite their rubber blankets. Pickets posted in thick brush find the night so dark that had a battle line of the enemy been within bayonet's thrust, it would have been invisible. Occasionally skirmishing with the Confederates, troops from Brigadier General Silas Casey's 3rd Division in the 4th Corps settle into a crossroads community called Seven Pines which is distinguished by two curious looking twin farmhouses. Originally, the houses were intended to be the opposite ends of a much larger mansion. The owners planned to live in the houses while construction went on for the palatial main building, but the intervening rooms were never built. Near the houses is a tremendous woodpile, 10 to 12 feet high and more than 100 feet long. Three-fourths of a mile west of Seven Pines, Casey's troops of the 3rd Division cut down trees to build a line of abatey in front of their earthwork. Half a mile to the east of the front line of works, a longer and heavier line of abatey shields the Williamsburg Road in Seven Pines. Between the two lines is the Union Camp, situated behind a line of defenses anchored by a five-sided earthwork fort called Casey's Redoubt. Behind Casey's men is Brigadier General Darius N. Couch's 1st Division. In the rear is Heinzelman's 3rd Corps. Farther back along the Williamsburg Road towards Bottoms Bridge are the 2nd and 3rd Divisions of Brigadier Generals Joseph Hooker and Philip Kearney, respectively. To the left, the Federals are shielded by White Oak Swamp, but to the front and right the Union works are unprotected by any natural barriers. Keyes recognizes the peril and tells staff officers on May 29th that our position is certain to tempt the enemy to attack us. Seeking to guarantee quick access to reinforcements from across the Chickahominy, Keyes puts his soldiers to work building several new bridges. Bridging the river is only part of the effort needed for the crossing. Each bridge requires hundreds of yards of corduroy roads to provide access across the saturated bottomlands. One of the new bridges is built by the 1st Minnesota Volunteer Infantry Regiment. Company officers supervise the work. With no help from Army engineers, there are hardened lifestyles as lumberjacks and woodworkers in the forested woodlands of Minnesota suits them in this new and improvised line of work. Without regulation bridge materials, soldiers chop down trees in the surrounding woods to hew beams and planks. To support the bridge, they build timber cribs. Each crib sinks deep into the mud, surrounded with stones to wade them down. Long stringers are laid across them to hold the roadway, which is then floored with split logs. Holding the bridge together are whiffs, flexible branches that firmly lash planks and beams together. While grapevines used for the whiffs provide the name for the span, Grapevine Bridge. By May 25th, General Johnson has set his plans in motion to attack the divided Union Army calling in troops from Petersburg, Gordonsville, and Fredericksburg. When assembled, the Confederates would number nearly 75,000. Each of Johnson's three top commanders have graduated from West Point in the class of 1842. Major General James Longstreet of South Carolina had served in the Indian Wars and the Mexican War. Also from South Carolina, Major General Daniel Harvey Hill, often shortened to D.H. Hill, had left the Army after the Mexican War to become a college professor an administrator in North Carolina. As Colonel of the 1st North Carolina Infantry Regiment, he won an early Confederate victory at the Battle of Big Bethel on June 10, 1861. Kentucky-born Major General Gustavus W. Smith had also left the Army in the 1850s. His training as a military engineer had helped secure him the post of Street Commissioner of New York City. Johnson originally planned to move against the Union forces on both sides of the Chickahominy on May 29th and shatter McClellan's army before it becomes even larger with the addition of McDowell's men. But late on the evening of May 28th, Brigadier General Jeb Stewart sends word that McDowell has been diverted to deal with Major General Thomas J. Stonewall Jackson's army in the Shenandoah Valley. For the time being, at least, Johnson could focus on smashing the small wing of the Union army. If the attack succeeds, the odds would be less daunting for an attack on the rest of the Federals north of the stream. The Confederate move is set for Sunday, May 31st.
Johnson divides his army in two for the attack. Two of Smith's divisions under Major Generals Ambrose Powell Hill and Prince John Magruder would shield the Confederates from enemy troops on the other side of the Chickahominy. For the main attack against the 31,500 troops of Keyes and Heinzelman, Johnson allots Longstreet 40,000 troops. They would advance along the three different roads and strike from three directions at once. D.H. Hill has orders to take the Williamsburg Stage Road, which runs directly east from Richmond to Seven Pines, and move against the enemy's center and right. Major General Benjamin Uji would cross the Williamsburg Stage Road and take the Charles City Road, which runs to the southeast. From there, a rural road runs north to a position menacing the Federal's left flank. Longstreet, in turn, would take the Nine Mile Road. For several miles, the Nine Mile Road runs parallel into the north of the Williamsburg Stage Road, but it takes a southeastern turn to cross the Richmond and York River Railroad at Fair Oaks before meeting the Williamsburg Stage Road at Seven Pines. Coming down from the northwest against Seven Pines, Longstreet would hit the Union right, prevent the escape of the enemy to Fair Oaks, or block any Union reinforcements coming from the Upper Chickahominy. For reinforcements, Brigadier General William H. C. Whiting's division is to follow Longstreet's force. The timing of the attack depends on Uji. Once his troops are in place on the Confederate right, he is to send a message to Hill, who would then open the attack on the enemy center. The sound of Hill's firing would be the signal for Longstreet to move in against the Union right. Uji would then move against the left. Johnson's plan promises great results but he evidently does not clearly explain it to any of his commanders. To Longstreet, who is placed in charge of the attack, Johnson gives only verbal orders. The two generals speak at length on May 30th, but by the next day it is clear that Longstreet has misunderstood his orders. Uji is not told that he is the key to the Confederate offensive. There is only a vague order advising him to be ready if an action should begin on your left to fall upon the enemy's left flank. It will prove to be a costly oversight. Heavy rain pounds both armies on the night before the attack and the Chickahominy quickly surges to new heights. At about 11 p.m. on May 30th, a detail pickets from the 33rd New York go to guard one of the half-built Chickahominy bridges. Within a short time, they are cut off from their main camp by the swiftly rising water. When another shift comes to relieve them at 2 a.m., standing nearly up to their armpits in the now new channel, and others, having lost their footing, were clinging to trees for dear life. The relief detail sends for boats to rescue their comrades. As the rain drifts on throughout the night, the stage is set for battle. In the early morning hours of May 31st, General Johnson prepares his troops for the long-awaited counterattack against McClellan. With the enemy at the gates, time is running short for Johnson's Department of Northern Virginia to repulse the Federals before they can begin a siege against the capital. Unbeknownst to both sides at the moment is the knowledge that the ensuing Battle of Seven Pines, or Battle of Fair Oaks, will become the largest and bloodiest battle of the war's eastern theater to date.